Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Richard Goldberg, Senior Advisor at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Richard, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me back. Of course, as you and I sit here right now, we are almost three months from Hamas's attack on Israel on October 7th. So where are they in terms of arriving at a new hostage deal that releases the hostages? Well, right now, uh, Hamas's days are numbered, and uh, they don't have a lot going for them other than the hostages as leverage over the Israelis. And so we have seen over the last couple of weeks, even though Israel has tried to broker some sort of additional deal through Egypt uh, and even the Qataris uh, supposedly playing some sort of role, uh, we have not seen Hamas come forward with any deal that Israel could accept. Uh, what they've said so far reportedly is, they would consider tranches of hostages in exchange for one month ceasefires uh, that would roll into another month and another month. So in other words, basically saying the war has to end and then they would think about uh, releasing hostages. Now that might change as uh, Israel gets deeper and deeper into southern Gaza, closer to where some of these leaders might be hiding. Uh, the killing of the number three in command who was operating out of Beirut uh, is certainly going to get the attention of Hamas leaders, uh, understanding that Israel is looking at a list of Hamas leaders and working down that list, trying to uh, eliminate all Hamas leaders, uh, including in Gaza and those that live outside of Gaza as well. Uh, but I think until Hamas leaders come to that conclusion that they are up against the wall in their final moments, uh, they may not play the hostage cards until then. Let's talk about that because you bring up an interesting point. Hamas's days are numbered. Can you explain why? Is that because earlier this week we did see a top Hamas leader killed in Beirut? Uh, it's mostly because of the IDF advances inside Gaza itself. Uh, the Israeli uh, defense forces have moved uh, quite uh, through northern Gaza, taking control of a vast amount of areas that were previously controlled by Hamas and now uh, destroying a lot of the tunnel infrastructure uh, we've seen in the news uh, throughout Gaza City and some of the northern areas above Gaza City. Uh, but more importantly now, they are advancing deep into southern Gaza and central Gaza, including the number two city in Gaza, uh, called uh, Han Yunus, uh, where the leaders uh, of uh, Hamas's military wing are believed to be hiding out. Many hostages uh, may be hidden there as well. And so as Israel continues to move deeper and deeper into Khan Yunus, the same way it did in northern Gaza, that means that uh, Hamas's remaining command and control will now be subject to targeting. And once that is eliminated, uh, Hamas's leadership, uh, their infrastructure, their hideouts, their tunnels, are vastly destroyed, uh, they will quickly lose control of the Gaza Strip. Uh, and once that happens, uh, you will be able to see mass surrenders potentially uh, from the mid and lower levels, uh, negotiations start potentially for Hamas members who want to leave Gaza in exchange for their lives uh, remaining, uh, hostage deals, things like this. So, uh, so long as the Israeli military continues its advance deeper into central and southern Gaza and resists calls to stop that advance, uh, Hamas's days will surely be numbered. Since the IDF is getting deeper and deeper into Gaza, what is the next stage of this war? From what you're sounding like, it sounds like it's nearing the end. Is that a fair assessment? I think major operations, the way that we have seen over the last uh, nearly three months, are likely nearing completion, certainly in the northern part of Gaza. Uh, I don't think we're nearing the end of uh, major military operations in the south and central Gaza. At least for a few more weeks, we may see that start winding down by the end of this month, uh, at some point in February. Uh, but the Israelis have also made clear that they expect a very long-term campaign in that south and central Gaza areas. Once they're done clearing and preparing the battlefields and moving their forces in, uh, they're going to be spending a lot of time with special operations forces, commandos, surgical operations and strikes, still hunting down all those leaders that will be trying to move around and evade and escape uh, Israeli capture uh, operations. Uh, and so I, I think uh, the Israelis are preparing for a months long stay uh, continued lower scale, lower intensity fighting 
uh, in the south and center of Gaza. The north will likely return to some sort of quiet. There will still be anti-tunneling operations. But at some point, we may even see populations that have moved south uh, during the war uh, start moving back to their homes in the north. I do now want to circle back to that top Hamas leader who was killed in Beirut earlier this week. Um, Israel has not officially claimed responsibility for that, but are there concerns that this will escalate the war, that there will be a wider scale conflict in the Middle East? Well, it's interesting that Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, had given a big speech a few weeks ago in which he threatened a big retaliation against Israel if Israel had attacked inside uh, Lebanese territory the way we saw with this strike. And in fact, this was a Hezbollah site that was attacked, but it was a surgical strike uh, from all the pictures uh, and readouts that we've seen, really pinpointed to this Hamas leader and other Hamas leaders accompanying him. And the Israelis have publicly said that even though they're not going to confirm it was them, it was obviously them, uh, that anybody who was behind it, as a spokesperson said, was targeting Hamas, not Hezbollah. Now, that same Hezbollah leader, Hassan Nasrallah, gave another speech this week, and he could have used that as an opportunity to say, we are going to retaliate now, I'm going to escalate the war against Israel from the north. He didn't do that. It was sort of a stepping back from the brink once again, a punting uh, of a major confrontation with Israel, now saying only if there was a major military operation against uh, Lebanese territory by Israel would Hezbollah retaliate in a much larger way. Now, we may be heading toward that end state anyways. Uh, Israel has signaled that it will not tolerate Hezbollah remaining militarily armed near its border ever again. Uh, that right now it's focused on clearing Hamas out of Gaza uh, so that it can return communities in the south of Israel to the border areas of Gaza that have all been evacuated. They're also going to have to deal with the evacuated communities in northern Israel who will not return to that border until Hezbollah is pushed away from it. Now, what exactly Israel will demand of Hezbollah uh, is not yet clear. We've heard some reports that say they want to see Hezbollah militarily disarmed and moved all the way north of the Latani River. That's some 20 miles plus north of Israel. There is a Security Council resolution that demanded that back in 2006. It's never been enforced. We've also, though, seen some reports of Israelis saying, well, five or six miles north of the border would be enough for us to be able to return communities uh, back to that border area. So we're going to have to wait and see what exactly is the Israeli bottom line for their security in the north. When are they willing to enforce that bottom line? Uh, will any political diplomacy uh, work to get Hezbollah to move on its own? I don't think so. I'm pretty doubtful on that. I think we will see military action of some kind. The question is, is it limited military action just uh, across the border of Israel, trying to move Hezbollah north five or six miles? Or is it a major military operation aimed at removing all of Hezbollah's military infrastructure south of the Latani River? I'm curious what your thoughts are on where Hezbollah is right now, because you think Hamas's days are number, but numbered. But since Hezbollah's leader set kind of punted, moved back from the brink, do you think Hezbollah's days are number two? Well, remember, Hezbollah is about a 10 times larger threat uh, than Hamas. Uh, they are deeply embedded uh, inside southern Lebanon. Uh, their uh, weapons, their missiles, their rockets, uh, their, their forces are deeply embedded in the civilian population uh, in Lebanon, just like we see Hamas embedded in the civilian population of Gaza. In fact, Hamas learned human shield tactics from Hezbollah, and we saw that uh, on full display in the last uh, Israel-Hezbollah war back in 2006. And so with 150,000 rockets and missiles, uh, with potentially cruise missile capabilities, with drone capabilities, anti-tank missiles, really advanced stuff that Iran has given Hezbollah. This would be a much larger military confrontation. Uh, Israel would sustain much larger attacks in response. Israel would have to respond in Lebanon in a more harsh way than we've seen in Gaza uh, to try to bring such an escalation quickly to an end. So uh, are Hezbollah's days in Lebanon numbered? I think that would be a very large scale military operation to imagine that. I don't think that's what uh, Israel has in mind. Uh, are Hezbollah's days in southern Lebanon numbered? 
uh, or in some distance from Israel's border numbered, that could be true. Uh, and depending on how uh, level, you know, what level of intensity Nasrallah responds with uh, against Israel, could mean Nasrallah's days are numbered as well. I do want to talk about something that you posted. I'll read it here, and then if you could explain it for us. You wrote this. Quote, basic truths to guide policy and analysis. Gaza has no future if Hamas survives. Israel will never be secure with Hezbollah on its border. Zone defense in the Red Sea will not keep international shipping safe. No threats exists in a vacuum. Tehran pulls all terror strings. Can you explain that for us? Yeah, I, what I'm trying to explain is uh, it's important for everybody to zoom out and not look at silos of stories that come out. We're very focused on a story that comes out of Gaza, and then there's a story that comes out of Lebanon, and then we see a news flash about Iraq or Syria and U.S. forces under attack. And then we turn our attention to the Red Sea, and what are we going to do about the Houthis in Yemen? It's important for us to zoom out and remember none of this is, exists in a vacuum. It's not, there are no coincidences in the Middle East right now. All of this is directed and coordinated by Iran. These are all terror proxies of the Islamic Republic of Iran. So first things first, get your Iran policy right. Lock down all the money we've made available to this regime. We haven't done that yet. There's a bill in the Senate to do that. That should be taken up. Crack down on the oil shipments where Iran makes money by, by sending oil to China. Do whatever you can to bring isolation to that regime. And make sure you have a military deterrent that they believe is credible, that you are willing to use military force against Iranian forces in the region and potentially against Iran itself as it races forward with its nuclear program, which we can't keep, take our eyes off either. But basic truths on these small areas in these individual arenas, we, there's a lot of international pressure, even pressure in Washington for Israel to slow down, to back off, to let Hamas survive and re-enter the political arena in the Palestinian areas. That would be a disaster. We would repeat history and see Hamas reassert itself with the threat in Gaza. Israel's not going to let that happen. Again, in, in, in northern Israel, the threat from their northern border in Hezbollah, Israel is not going back to October 6 uh, ideas about living with threats on its borders. They're not going to allow their northern communities to wake up one day to paragliders and an invasion from Hezbollah forces with 150,000 rockets behind it. That is going to be military action that is coming by Israel to clear that threat from its border. And in the Red Sea, as we see missiles, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, drones continue to be fired against commercial shipping, we can't just rely on zone defense of trying to run three U.S. destroyers up and down the Red Sea hoping to intercept these missiles. We are not going to protect international shipping. Prices will go up. Shipping will be redirected. Iran will have defeated us in a core mission of the U.S. Navy of defending freedom of navigation. And so we have to switch from defense to offense and actually deal with the threat that's coming from Yemen. And of course, where is it being directed from? Who's the coordinator? The Islamic Republic of Iran. I do want to talk about the Houthis because White House uh, National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said this over the weekend that the U.S. is, quote, not looking for a conflict with the Houthis and that, quote, the best outcome here would be for the Houthis to stop these attacks. What do you make of that response? Uh, it's a political statement, obviously. There, there is some point at which the administration is going to have to show a backbone. Uh, you know, it reminds me of telling the Taliban uh, you know, don't walk on Kabul, don't invade Kabul, don't bring the Afghan government down, the world is watching, you'll be judged, don't do this. You know, words don't scare these types of adversaries. Actions are the only thing that deters them. And so we're going to rely on words uh, to stop Houthi missiles and drones from flying into the Red Sea. That's going to be a, a recipe for disaster. We are at some point going to have to put our actions behind our, behind our words, behind our threats, and make sure that the Houthis, but more importantly Iran knows, we're willing to use force to protect our interests. How do you think that the United States would show and demonstrate that then to Iran? There's a number of options on the table right now for the administration. Uh, here's a few of them. One, if you were to strike targets inside of Yemen, uh, you would look for specific command and control targets of the Houthis. 
if you can actually locate some of their bases uh, where they are moving around these missiles, uh, their launchers, and target some of them. Uh, whoever the coordinators, the commanders of these units are, if you can locate them. If there are IRGC, Revolutionary Guard Corps operatives on the ground that you can find and locate, they'll really be the quarterbacks who are calling all these plays for the Houthis. Um, there's other targets available inside Yemen. But also look at the ships that Iran runs off the coast of Yemen. They actually have cargo vessels that they've retrofitted into what are essentially spy vessels. And these are the ships that are looking at all of the different maritime traffic coming through the uh, waterway there uh, into the Red Sea. And they basically call up the Houthis and say, hey, we have a vessel. Here's where it is. Here's where you should target your missile or your drone. Go fire. And so it's literally the Iranians sitting on this cargo ship off the coast of Yemen that are calling the shots here. We could attack that vessel as well, take it out of the game. Um, and of course, there are escalation moves all the way to Iran itself. That is the highest part of the escalation curve. You would obviously seek to, to do something lower to see if you can restore, deter restore deterrence without attacking inside Iran kinetically. Though we, of course, have cyber options that we can employ at any time inside of Iran. With these tensions escalating in Gaza, in the Red Sea, in Lebanon, in the region as a whole, what do you see Iran's uh, role in this war looking like going forward? Well, Iran obviously right now, I think, is pursuing a weapon of mass distraction throughout the region as it continues to pursue and develop a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, we just heard uh, from the UN nuclear watchdog that Iran has racing forward with its production of high enriched uranium. It's still working on a deep underground new facility that we suspect may be where they're going to uh, have a nuclear breakout if that facility is completed and they move their enrichment, te enrichment technology down in there. A facility that we suspect, according to public reporting, is meant to be impenetrable to military strike. So there are a lot of clocks running right now clocks on whether or not we are willing to restore deterrence for international shipments going through the Red Sea, clocks on the nuclear program to ensure that this regime never acquires uh, nuclear weapons, doesn't cross the nuclear threshold, clocks uh, for Israel to restore deterrence on its northern border, clocks in Gaza as well. All these clocks are running. Meanwhile, what is our Iran policy? Are we still trying to throw money at this regime to induce better behavior? It's not working. It's not working. It hasn't worked. It has failed. Are we going to try to close down all the access to resources for this regime, try to choke the regime off of money, of political support, while we restore military deterrence in the region? I think that's the right policy. We haven't done it yet. The administration hasn't done it yet. Congress can start that by passing legislation that's sitting in the Senate already passed by the House. Richard, I really enjoy talking to you because you really give us that 30,000 uh, foot view. You're showing us, hey, don't look at one specific story over another. These are all connected. This is a connected web. So with that in mind, what is the most important thing that our viewers should be looking out for next? Uh, I think the number one thing to think about is what is the view from Tehran at any given moment? Does Tehran view itself on offense in the Middle East and uh, having the room uh, to continue to push the envelope in every theater where it has a terror proxy? Or does Iran feel like it's on defense, that it has to pull back, it has to put out the fires that it has started, it has to keep itself from crossing the nuclear threshold, it's afraid of its own people and instability inside the regime? I think today Iran is on offense and believes it can remain on offense for the time being. We need to flip the script on Tehran. How do you do that? Pressure and deter. Increase the economic and political pressure on the regime, lock down all the money that's been made available, snap back the UN sanctions uh, on the regime at the Security Council, try to isolate it uh, in the international community, and then make sure that Tehran believes you are willing to use military tools to stop it from all of its malign activities, including its nuclear program. That might start in Yemen. It might start with an Iranian ship off the coast of Yemen. It starts maybe in Iraq and Syria. Uh, it may actually need to happen in Iran as well, uh, ultimately. Uh, but I think that's the thing to think about is, is Iran on offense? Is Iran on defense? What do its leaders perceive as U.S. Uh, will and capabilities in the region to deter them? 
uh, if the administration won't take that action, Congress is going to have to take the lead here. Richard Goldberg, per usual, I really appreciate your insights. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much.